everybody. Welcome to the National Heritage Area's Best Practices call. It is August, I think. Um, I'm Sarah Lyle, probably a new face for some of y'all, but I am on the Best Practices call team and I am the Director of Interpretation for Arabia Mountain National Heritage Area. So welcome and um, thanks for coming. Um, this is a really exciting topic to talk about, the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage. So we're here to learn about what great work y'all are doing. Um, before we get started, please remember to mute your microphone um, if you're not asking a question. Um, we will be recording this webinar, just want to let you know that. And then if you do have questions for our speakers, please reserve those to the end um, after everyone has spoken. And if you're like me and you forget things a lot, you can go ahead and type it into the chat box and we'll keep an eye on it and make sure to bring it back up at the appropriate time. Um, so we're really excited about our, um, our speakers today. Um, our first speaker is gonna be Patrice Tedesto from Freedom's Way National Heritage Area. And I will hand it over to Patrice. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this up. Oops, not that yet. That's the end. Ha. Huh. All right. Um, one second. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Patrice Tedisco from the Freedom's Way National Heritage Area, which uh, encompasses 45 communities in Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire. Um, I like to use um, Concord and Lexington as grounding points for our heritage area because most people know where those are. Um, we decided this year to do something new, and that was we decided that we would choose um, to wrap all of our work within um, the umbrella, if you will, of an interpretive, a thematic interpretive annual sort of presentation. And we chose the 19th Amendment because we felt that it was a great um, starting point for us and it was something that we knew um, we could have information or we could have research or we could have opportunities to work with everyone in each of our communities. We knew it was a theme that would touch all 45 communities. And so what we decided to do was we offered um, both our grant programs, our community outreach programs, and our social media. Um, we used uh, the 19th Amendment, if you will, as sort of the grounding point for this um, coordinated presentation. So what we've done, and um, you can see this is our website and all of this information is on our website. Um, we did several combined projects slash programs. Um, one was called 100 Years, 100 Days, 100 Facts, um, and it was a countdown. It will end next week on Wednesday, the 26th, which is the date that the adoption was certified for the amendment. And so every day for 100 days, and I'm scrolling down here so you can see these, on our um, Twitter accounts, our Instagram, and our Facebook, we um, presented one fact. Well, would you like to walk people through this? Through each of these facts? I'm sorry, what was the question? I'm sorry, do you want me to, I, I'm just gonna show you these and then if you wanna go back in and read each of the facts, you can. Is that was, I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was a, a question or just an, an, an accidental unmute. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. just keep going, Patrice. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure I understood. So you'll see on our webpage, those each fact is posted. Um, it's, it's now here on our webpage and each at the end um, of the 100 days, we're gonna combine all of these facts into a, one sort of booklet that people can then, um, they can access. And each of the facts, not, not all of them, but most of them when you uh, click on them, you'll get additional information. So that was one of the first things we did. Um, I'm sorry. Um, we also did, let me pull this down. Um, we have a program that we started last year as well. It's called Heritage Stories. And Heritage Stories is also a way, for, it's a way for us to tell the stories of individuals within the heritage area that we call visionaries, experimenters, and innovators. So we have done, uh, we have focused our heritage stories this year on women. Um, and again, you can go to our website. These are vodcasts that are um, all on YouTube. Um, we started with Hazel Mackay. Um, Hazel Mackay is from Shirley, she's a suffragist. Um, and we worked with the Shirley Historical Society to do Hazel Mackay. 
Um, and then we also profiled women from different towns in the heritage area. We felt stories, and we felt that their stories were very, you know, just really worthy of sharing. Um, interestingly enough, I was just looking at this this, this morning, and I, um, I noticed that one of our most popular ones is Fanny Farmer, uh, who's from Medford. And I've decided that might be because all of us had to suffer through cooking classes or us that are older than some of you. Um, and so we all know who Fanny Farmer is. Um, but the one that we just did and we published last week uh, is here. It's Congresswoman um, Edith Norse Rogers, who actually was the first Congresswoman from New England, one of the longest serving Congresswomen. Um, she was also the mother of the Women's Army Corps and Fort Devens. So those are all on YouTube and they've been very popular and we've got a couple of more lined up that we hope to get done before the end of the year. We, we have a program that we do uh, each month with community partners. It's called community, Connecting Communities Walks and Talks. Um, and this year, unfortunately, not all of these were able to um, come to fruition. But once again, um, this year, the theme for all of these walks and talks were women. So we partnered with community organizations to present these, the ones that did happen, not all of them did, um, but we did Lydia Mariah Child in Medford, um, Sarah Doublet in Littleton, and we did Clara, we did Clara Endicott Sears in Harvard, and um, the rest, oops, we did Harriet Wilson, um, but the rest have been canceled, although this Saturday, we are extremely excited because Shirley is going to do the walks and talks on Hazel Mackay. So that was the other thing we did. And then our culminating, oops, um, our color, well, one of our culminating features is that we've done an ebook. And again, this is a real learning curve for us, but this will be published next week on Wednesday. And this ebook profiles, um, commemorates the 19th Amendment. It profiles 72 women from within the heritage area who, again, um, innovators, experimenters, um, some of them are really well known, Louisa May Alcott, of course. Um, others are not as well known. And so we have done research in each of these women. Uh, we thought it would be a nice way to conclude the year by having something that's tangible because one of the things in our heritage area we're working on is um, we are creating a lot of content. Um, one of our goals is to create our heritage area as a virtual museum. And so we are looking at creating content. So this book was a way for us to take all of the information and all of the stories that we learned this year and to have something that's tangible and can live on after the year. Because I think we all do programs and projects, we have exhibitions and et cetera, but um, nonetheless, you know, we wanted to have something that we could say, this was the product of this year's work around this theme of women in the 19th century. So we have um, three tiers of women. Um, the first are all the women that were doing the Heritage Story Vlogcasts on. Um, and then we go into women that were firsts or founders. And we had an incredible amount of love. We had an incredible amount of um, good fortune in finding these women. But we know that these stories, um, the ones that we found, are just the tip of the iceberg. And I think we were all a little bit gobsmacked at how, how many incredible women lived within the heritage area. So this is gonna be, I think, a really great product for us. Um, it will be online and we are hoping to have a lot of outreach to our community partners and schools and others and hope that people get a lot of use out of this document. So that is what we have done um, for the 19th Amendment. I'm going really fast because I know my 10 minutes are just about up. Any questions or thoughts on this though? Thank you, Patrice. I just, wow, that's a, so much beautiful work. And I, all the content, like I, I'm really impressed with how deep it goes. Um, I, I did have just one little quick question before we transition. Um, you mentioned within the 100 days um, promotion, I guess. How was the engagement with that on social media? Did you find that people were, you know, eager for the next fact or... I was kind of curious about how it performed in that way. Sure, I'm not gonna say that people were eager for the next fact. Um, I would say that, I, and I think all of us, you know, I think we're all familiar with this sort of issue of social media. Um, we did get a lot of engagement and we also did have, you know, you know have them share quite a bit. 
Um, I'm not sure, you know, I think one of the things that we constantly think about is how you make information available or how information, um, you know, how much energy and effort you spend to get this uh, information into the public realm, so to speak. So yes, the program was very successful. Um, we learned a lot doing it. I think what we mostly learned this year is how, um, for us in our heritage area, which of course every heritage area is different, how when we chose a thematic presentation, we were able to engage um, the communities sort of in you know, helping us to tell that story. Because we're always just very aware of the fact that again, our, our communities are very diverse, um, but they have these common threads. And so when we did the facts, we tried really hard. Um, we asked our community partners to share facts with us. So, you know, we probably had about 50% engagement in that, where we actually had facts about, you know, women from South, or women from Congo, or, you know, the first woman to come, you know, in this town, the first woman to come that. And then we also tried to tell the national story within that framework. So throughout this year, we were balancing both the local and the national story so that everyone in the community could find their place within that bigger story, if you will, that bigger picture. Awesome. Awesome, thank you. Well done, good work. All right, and if y'all have questions, just remember either write those down or just put them in the chat and we can kind of get into a, a deeper discussion in a little bit. All right, next up is Scott Keller from the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area. So Scott's gonna share his screen and take it away. All right, can everybody uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? All right, and now I need to get rid of the stuff that's blocking it. There we go. Um, so the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area is celebrating not only the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, and we but also women's history in the Hudson Valley. Um, the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area was designated by Congress in 1996 and renamed for our Congressman Maurice D. Hinchy in 2019, who had unfortunately passed away. We cover 10 counties bordering four states, New York City, Lake Champlain uh, Partnership, and Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. So we're, we're kind of surrounded by uh, really good stuff. And our heritage area is managed by the New York State Hudson River Valley Greenway. Unlike most places, we don't have one or two sites. We have 106 sites. We don't do a lot of the, the core interpretation and programming ourselves, but we serve as a coordination unit. The first event we tried to put on was uh, to celebrate women's history was to be a collaborative effort led by the National Park Service was called Sharing Women's History in the Hudson Valley. It was going to be held December 3rd at the FDR Estate in Hyde Park. We wanted to convene the local partners within and adjacent to, the, to our heritage area to share commemoration plans and facilitate collaboration in order to create a richer narrative of suffrage and women's history within the region by weaving together sites that represent different parts of the story. And the National Park Service very generously was willing to share the resources and projects that they had available for partner use. Um, within our heritage area alone, the Park Service had identified 67 historic sites with significant women's history that needed to be um, shared and interpreted. Um, unfortunately, it snowed. Um, it snowed a lot, so that got canceled. Um, we rescheduled it for March, not realizing there was a pandemic coming, so that got canceled. Um, then we thought about trying to do a remote conference, but um, with the way New York was, we didn't know when our heritage sites were going to reopen. Um, at the height of the pandemic, uh, New York had nearly 20,000 people in the hospital and near, nearly 5,000 in ICU. Total hospitalizations today are under uh, 500 or around 550 with a number of patients in an ICU under 150. New York has conducted over 7 million tests and has had a positive test rate of under 1% for the last two weeks. Um, so we're, we're in good shape to, to reopen our heritage sites. Um, the problem is the two hardest hit regions were New York City where many of our tourists come from and the Hudson Valley where many of our, where all of our sites are located. Um, New York is 
reopening the state in four phases based on seven metrics measuring testing capacity, infection rates and severity, and hospital capacity. Um, phase four industries, which are the very last to open, include arts and entertainment, and that's where heritage sites and museums are located. So, um, for example, in New York City, they just last week or next week will be get, getting permission to reopen their museums. Um, so we had to retrench, and what we did was in February we created a women's rights web page, um, highlighting the role women played in the history and folklore of the Hudson River Valley, including one of the earliest female light housekeepers who uh, was working from 1857 to 1907. At the time of her retirement, she was one of the oldest keepers in the nation, and a pirate who was featured on that noted historical program, Drunk History. Um, the page includes interpretation, photos, and audio stories from our Hudson River train tour app that feature uh, women like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Sadie the Goat the Pirate, amongst others. Um, our women's rights page has been viewed several hundred times since it launched, which is, is pretty good for us, particularly in an era when most of our sites aren't open. One of the things that we combined on our page was a, a calendar that had um, just women's events. We, we put up a, a special category for women's rights events. Um, we had a small number of events listed prior to the pandemic. Many of those became virtual events and exhibits. We still have one that's ongoing and one that's upcoming. Uh, in November, Claremont will host Women Voted Here Before Columbus talking about Native Americans and how they were governed and their political representation. And then there's a permanent exhibit on Eleanor Roosevelt and Valk Hill, the emergence of a political leader um, located at her cottage, Valk Hill. Um, as I said, we, we do a lot of coordination with our, uh, with our sites and, and we try to fund them as much as we can. One of our programs is a sponsorship program. Uh, we partner with various organizations to sponsor programs that reinforce the heritage area's mission while complementing the mission of the, of the um, sites that we're, we're working with. Uh, we found that these events deliver significant tourism and economic benefits to communities and encourage local and regional partnerships. Eligible applicants are municipalities and not-for-profit lo organizations located within the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area. Doesn't necessarily have to be a designated site, but they get extra points for that. Um, we did have one event that uh, was related to women's rights that did um, actually happen um, immediately before we were shut down. The Let's Bike Hudson Valley Women's Bicycle Festival, we awarded a $2,500 sponsorship to Scenic Hudson and they did a bike tour around the mid Hudson Valley um, going and visiting different historic sites that uh, featured uh, women's history. Uh, we also have a heritage development grant program for 2020 and 2021. We are adding a scoring bonus for heritage grants that um, feature women's rights and suffrage. Five out of the 10 awarded grants this year will highlight or focus on women Another round of grants will be awarded in the fall and applications are due September 11th. One thing we're doing to try to help our um, sites is in the past, we've not allowed their personal services to be part of the grant. Um, we are now doing that in order to try to keep some of our smaller sites, um, make sure that they have staff when they do get to, when they do reopen and, and they do get to reopen with, um, with more than 30% or 35% uh, attendance. So the five grants that we've awarded so far, 5,000 to the Friends of the Schuyler Mansion for sharing a fuller story through uh, multimedia per perspectives. This project expands on the mansion's interactive full-length touchscreen displays in their lobby and will include the story of an, an escaped enslaved woman and the story of Margaret Schuyler. We've awarded $5,000 to the Natural Heritage Trust, which is a uh, a not-for-profit associated with our, our historic our, the State Historic Preservation Office for a thematic survey of Dutch cultural resources in the Hudson Valley. And what we found is that the role of women in, in colonial Dutch culture was quite different from that of English and other cultures. Women could own property, run businesses, handle financial transactions, and inherit property. So this survey will go a long ways towards identifying women significant in the culture and history of the Hudson Valley. 
we've provided um, on a much more focused area. We've provided almost $5,000 to the Rear Center for Immigration, Culture, and History for furnishings and signage for the Rear Bakery. This project will highlight the lives of the Rear Sisters as examples of women who are often absent from the historical record. Their story focuses on four unmarried, working class, middle-aged in 1959, Orthodox Jewish women who operated the bakery and lived together with their two brothers above the bakery. And we awarded $4,000 to the Town of Sardis Historical Society for development of a self-guided walking tour via brochure that would be available in both printed and PDF form. The informational brochure will highlight locals women hit local women's history and provide information on the events in the 10, 1910s and 20s during the time of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the final grant was um, nearly $5,000 to Walkway Over the Hudson for new virtual programming. Uh, the Walkway Over the Hudson is the highest and longest pedestrian span at the world. It's uh, 216 feet above the Hudson River and it and extends for over a mile across it at Poughkeepsie. The walkway receives over 500,000 visitors a year, and this project will include a virtual lecture on Sojourner Truth, the Underground Railroad, and a plant statue of Sojourner Truth to be, to be located on one end of the walkway. And the last thing that we're doing is we're encouraging our sites, hoping for a better 2021 than 2020, we're encouraging our heritage sites to continue to celebrate um, the centennial and women's history in 2021 um, using the tagline, it took women too long to get the right to vote uh, and it's gonna take too long for us to celebrate the centennial. And that's all I've got. Awesome, thank you so much, Scott. That's, there are so many wonderful projects that y'all are supporting and I appreciate the sort of the, the contrast between Patrice and like how, um, you know, you're, you're providing the funds for these uh, different partners to, to do this work. So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. All right. Next. Yeah, we're definitely coming at totally different angles to it. And, and yeah. I, I love what Patrice is doing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. Next up, we have Jim Brangan from Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership. Jim, there you are somewhere outside. Lucky you. Oh, yeah. Jim, I did my best to show your pictures. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that looks great on the screen, Katie. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the projects that are underway here. Um, much like Scott, we had a, uh, a gangbuster start last winter. Uh, we were attending um, conferences and, and uh, presentations with standing room only capacity. Uh, people were really geared up for this. The uh, Vermont League of Women Voters in particular really pulled out the stops and uh, are still continuing to do good work. You can check out their website. Um, uh, and like Patrice, we found that we have some remarkable women living in the Champlain Valley and we have some historically remarkable women who lived in the Champlain Valley. Um, the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, if you go to their website, you can check out uh, Women at the Helm, which talks about the, uh, the, uh, the, the important roles that women took um, historically and continue to take today, everything from being steamboat captains to uh, scientists that, that lead up research on Lake Champlain. In fact, uh, we have several outstanding um, fishery biologists and water quality scientists who work on our technical advisory committee for Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, and so right here in the Champlain Valley, uh, in our heritage area, I should say, uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony uh, was raised in um, Battenville, New York, which is in Warren County, and then uh, we have the, the martyr of the suffrage movement, uh, the woman that led the 1913 parade on horseback, Inez Milholland. Uh, she died at the age of 30 uh, while giving a speech in Los Angeles about suffrage. She didn't live to see the uh, amendment passed, but she's buried over in Lewis, New York. So um, we have almost an embarrassment of resources when it comes to telling the suffrage story here. Um, and I have to say, after all of these years of interpreting, you know, the proverbial dead white man on horseback, this has been a really rewarding uh, work process for me. Um, last year, we awarded 
seven different grants, totally $78,000. And they're all in different stages of, of completion. Um, the Chapman Museum, which was going to stage various parades and uh, autocades and, and, and demonstrations and, and sing-ins, uh, they decided to postpone until next year. Um, the, our friends at, uh, excuse me, the friends of Crown Point State Historic Site basically put press pause and just recently they pulled their, their thumb off the pause button. Um, we have had presentations down at the Bennington Battlefield in New York, uh, the Bennington Battlefield Monument last Saturday in um, uh, down in Bennington, Vermont. And um, this weekend we're having a weekend long seminar uh, with that includes presentations and screenings of documentaries and other films. Um, at Crown Point State Historic Site. We had to completely change our work plans. Um, we're renting a lot of tents these days and everything's being done in accordance with New York and state, uh, New York, Vermont state protocols. Um, the Fort Ticonderoga Association, Sarah Pell, who rebuilt the fort for the tercentennial Champlain's arrival to the lake back in 1909. Um, she has a collection of papers at the fort uh, that the, uh, the, the Fort Ticonderoga Association is compiling and interpreting. There will be a, um, a permanent exhibit. Unfortunately, it, wasn't, it was supposed to happen this year. It's coming up next year, but there will be stuff online um, about Sarah. Uh, like I said, lots of remarkable women here. Um, and then we also have uh, the Maritime Museum, uh, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum is opening up on uh, Labor Day weekend. That's the only three days they're going to be open this year, uh, which is a shame. The grounds will be open. They'll have outdoor interpretation. And um, part of uh, Basin program's role, or the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership's role, is to um, is to fill in the gaps. And last year we commemorated the International Year of the Salmon, and um, it was wildly successful. We had we had partnerships that we we had never had before. Um, new groups were reaching out to making that link between natural and cultural heritage. Um, and I don't know if anyone else got these, but um, a few years back in 2014, I think it was, no, 2016, I beg your pardon, um, the National Park Foundation sent us a bunch of find your park pull-up banners. And um, we decided to repurpose those and develop a series of interpretive banners on the uh, on salmon, uh, on the, the, the natural history of them and, um, and the cultural significance and the reintroduction. So it was hugely successful. And what behind me here is a, uh, is a representation. Katie, can you uh, share my screen? Maybe. I'm, just, I'm looking, I'm seeing if I can. Okay. Bigger. Um. I did a thing that says spotlight video, but I don't think it's happening. Okay. Well, if you can, you can see this. Um, these are this year's interpretive banners. Um, you can see them in the photo that I sent Katie earlier. Uh, here we are. Hi, everybody. Um, and so we've developed uh, six interpretive panels with uh, an introductory panel, of course. There's uh, the lovely and, and intelligent uh, and uh, uh, fantastic Inez Milholland um, down there. I'm sure you've all seen that. Um, we have uh, the general uh, interpretive display that talks about women's suffrage in the Champlain Valley. Of course, we highlight Rose Paul in that as well. And there's another rendering of... Uh, Inez on horseback. Um, we bring in uh, the, the states. Uh, Vermont had a, a long slog getting to, uh, to uh, women's suffrage. In fact, the governor, it could have been Vermont that was the, the state to ratify the constitution, but the governor refused to uh, convene the legislature. He was afraid that women were going to uh, repeal uh, the consumption and production of alcohol. Um, and then, of course, Quebec, uh, they had even longer fight. Women didn't get the right to vote in Quebec until 1940. Um, and then these are double-sided 
um, when we talk about um, how complex a movement it is, uh, there, there was all sorts of iconic uh, icons involved, um, lots of crusaders, uh, um, very interesting symbolism, including the sash. I'm not sure if you can notice that I'm wearing the sash. Um, and then we talk about New York State um, leading the way. Uh, there's Inez Milholland's grave there. There's Inez on the, uh, on, uh, the stallion. Um, and down here is Louisine uh, Havemeyer, who uh, her daughter founded the Shelburne Museum just down the road from us here. Um, and then, of course, we, we can't really tell the story without putting it into a modern context. And uh, as you all know, um, her work does continue. So these um, are very popular. We're calling it pop-up interpretation. Uh, we have a calendar uh, set up and basically they're, they're, they're uh, taken until uh, the end of September. And I just wanted to show you next year, we'll be commemorating the uh, 18th Amendment, which uh, brought along prohibition and everything that comes along with that. So that's about it. Anyone have any questions? Oh, well, I guess we should wait till the end, right, Katie? I want to know about your hat. Oh, I've had this hat for a million years. <laughs> I, yeah, keep, I, keep threatening, I keep threatening to get rid of it, but you know, I can't find a better one. I think it has the suffrage colors. I thought it was really well plotted out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I should put some purple in there, huh? Very well, dashing. Personally, I love the sash. I think the sash makes the outfit. Right? Hey, and you can also see I've got a t-shirt that uh, one of my colleagues bought us all suffrage t-shirts, um, which was you know, kind of a fun event. <laughs> Turned around at a meeting and they're all wearing t-shirts. So uh, yeah, it's been great. This has been a lot of fun. I'm actually kind of looking forward to 2021 to, uh, to pull out the stops on this uh, because there are so many great stories to tell. Um, and you know, what's better than, than uh, you know, badass women and, and prohibition? It's, it's going to be a good year next year. Well, and before we take overall questions, um, Megan Springgate from the National Park Service is going to share some things that are happening currently that all, all of you can participate in and just kind of talk about the Park Service um, commemoration as well. Never sure, forget. thanks. Um, I am just blown away by the amount of work that you all are doing out there. Um, thank you so much for, for doing that. And uh, um, Ella Wagner, who is a women's history uh, fellow here in the office where I work, um, is actually a scholar of the temperance movement. So um, just to sort of file that away for the prohibition stuff tomorrow. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's so much going on. I don't want to take up all your time and, and just give you the and, 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 and. Um, but there are some th three sort of key pieces that, uh, to let you know about. Um, let's see if I can, the first is forward into light. And I'm gonna actually just post the links in the chat. Uh, forward into light is a program of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, the Congressional Commission for the 19th Amendment, and um, on the night of August 26th, next Wednesday, they're asking folks to light up either physical structures with purple and gold lights, um, or in um, on social media, and somewhere I have a filter that you can use on social media. I'll find it when I'm not talking, because too many clickings through things. Um, but there's a filter you can overlay on a photograph in the purple and gold colors that says forward into light and you can um, use that as well uh, for social media um, posting. We have um, podcasts which are really wonderful. This was done in collaboration with the National Park Service and uh, the commission and PRX, and you'll recognize PRX from public radio shows like This American Life and The Moth Radio Hour, so the production values are amazing. Um, there are two, one is, um, sorry, 
One, one is for, ki for tweens, for kids, and it's a sort of historical fiction. Um, the kids wear a, find an old votes for women sash, and it takes them back in time uh, to key moments in the, in the battle for, for suffrage, and they meet some of the key uh, movers and shakers. Um, it's a lot of fun. And then the other series called And Nothing Less is for um, more grown-up people, I guess. Uh, and that is hosted by Rosario Dawson and Retta. Um, and it's a, it's a really lovely and nuanced um, podcast uh, that looks into suffrage. Um, the myths, myths and Legends was episode two. Um, uh, episode three is truth is uh, truth is of no color. Um, so they're they're. I'm really impressed with the facility that they they have in in navigating all of the complexities of suffrage um, in a way that is completely like understandable and entertaining and um, nice to have. And there's also some extra bonus material um, on the podcast pages for an on nps.gov. And then the last um, thing I would like, I would love to do um, is to share all of the great work that you all are doing around the 19th Amendment uh, and women's history this year and into next year. We've got, we've definitely got some programs too that are going into next year. Um, so if you could send me information, I'll put my email address in the chat. Uh, so we're compiling information on what people have done, looking for um, what are your projects, uh, links, links if you have them to social media or web stuff, um, the names of those involved, addresses uh, and the effects of COVID on your plans and there are um, so there are three carrots for you to send me that information I know some of you have access behind the firewall at nps.gov but I also know that a, a lot of you don't um, so there are three carrots for that. Uh, one is uh, we have these amazing NPS only um, challenge coins for women's rights for, or for suffrage rather. Uh, so we're sending those out to folks in the NPS and our partners, which of course includes um, all y'all, uh, for folks who have done something around the 19th Amendment and women's history. Um, so that's one carrot, it's actual thing that you can, you can have and they're very cool. Uh, we are also, um, the GIS folks uh, here in Washington are creating a story map um, documenting participation. Uh, so there will be a, a map you can click through and, and see all the cool stuff that people have done across the NPS and our, our close partners. Um, and then also inclusion in the final report. So um, three carrots, no sticks for sharing that information um, with me. And Rebecca, yes, there's also the Girl Scout Ranger patch. Um, I will post the link for that uh, also. Um, but yes, so there's just, there's a lot. There's just, there's so much and it's so great. And um, yeah, I, again, thank you so much all for doing such amazing, wonderful work um, around, the, around the centennial commemoration. I'm deeply grateful and I, I want to make sure you get your carrots. Awesome. Thank you, Megan, so much for sharing. Is there, I know that there may have been some other heritage areas that were also doing some um, of these programs. Is there anybody on the call that wants to share what they're doing? Um, you know, maybe not super in depth as some of our, as some of, the, of our presenters, um, but any other things that you've been doing around this, this theme? Anybody? And if you're shy, you can put it in the chat too. Hi, this is 
National Heritage Area. I just wanted to say, I think this has been the most fun call that we've done. I've really learned a lot and it's given me a lot of ideas and I've been riding with my carpool with uh, some girls and I won't let him out of the car now until we were done. So um, we have a, we have kind of an interesting thing on a personal note. It was great to um, hear that the Native Americans are being um, recognized for their culture because uh, being a, a, a citizen of Cherokee Nation, it's just really nice to hear some some good stories about that and then on another note uh, we have been working with uh, utah believe it or not has a really interesting history as far as women's rights back in the the uh, 1800s and in fact the first woman who was able to vote voted in salt lake in 1870. Uh, we also have a, a group of some really amazing women that um, didn't much like how their town was being taken care of and so they went in and ran for um, mayor and city council and we had an all-female government in Camas for a good bit. Um, so it's just a lot of fun to hear. Um, another fun little note, one of the women that, the woman that was elected mayor is my husband's fourth great grandmother. So it's just kind of fun again on a personal note, but this has been such a great call and you know, thank you guys so much. You're welcome, thank you, Dina. Any other questions? I'm gonna to have to go through my question list. Okay, so Cash Laporte had a question, um, and this one's for Patrice. Patrice, did Freedom's Way hire a graphic designer or do you have one on staff? Okay, um, well, first let me be very clear that our staff is two full-time people. Uh, so they're one of the smaller heritage areas. Um, but we do have a graphic designer who does um, work with, uh, he works with us on a stipend and volunteers his time as well. And so, um, you know, playing to the strengths of the folks um, that, you know, are on our team, um, he has been integral in us as we have, um, so, so, so as we have like redefined um, sort of the, the feel of the heritage area because we've tried really hard in the last couple of years to do very high quality uh, graphic presentations. And so, yes, uh, Richard is with us, but he is not on staff. Does that answer the question? I hope. Yes, yes. thank you. This yeah. is Megan with uh, Cash the Pooter. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to compliment you all. I thought the graphic design is beautiful. And I feel your, your uh, pain with a uh, small staff. There's only three of us and uh, interns here and there, but yeah, great work. Thank you. Uh, and then for us, I think, you know, again, we've done a lot of work on how, how we present ourselves, because uh, we think that's very important, particularly in attracting new audiences. And so um, having somebody who's just really understands and gets it, because um, graphics can be very tricky. Um, so the look and feel of the organization and the materials we present um, have been something we spent a lot of time on. And it's fun. And it is fun. I also just want to compliment, I'd like to compliment Jim on um, finding a use for the uh, banners from Find Your Park, because we've got a, we got a whole bunch of those too. <laughs> and we trip over them all the time. They're in our office in big boxes. Um, but I am like, that's a great idea to you to do a pop up thing and reuse those. And we've been struggling with what to do with them. We don't because they were obviously extremely expensive. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad to see their repurpose. So now next year in our next theme for next year, we can do a pop up one as well. So that's a great idea. We've, we've done best best ours too. <laughs> yeah, we have a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah, so th those ones from uh, the for Find Your Park are interior grade. The ones I showed you, we actually went ahead and bought um, oh. it's because of COVID. We, we wanted to be able to have our interpretation outside. But we're using the, we've repurposed the International Year of the Salmon to have uh, uh, two of these exhibits in, in areas that are indoors, like the, the Plattsburgh Mall, which has loads of empty storefronts right now. So mm -hmm. they're allowing us to, to display the interpretation in there. So there, yeah, and if anyone wants to get rid of them, send yeah. them to me. I'll pay freight. Oh, okay. good to know. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I have a question for Patrice as well. Um, the ebook that you're publishing, when you publish it, where is it going to be like published? Is it going to be 
like on your website where you can, you know, buy it or how is that being done? Okay, well, first of all, this is our first book. Uh, and so we are learning um, as we're doing it, we're going, you know, step by step. We're not selling it. So um, it's not, you know, we're not doing this book as a for profit. Um, so it will be on our website, we will be circulating it, and then we'll also have it, we'll have a number, and we're not sure yet where we'll place it, how we will get it out into the public. We're working on that now. Okay. So I will let you know, it's a, it's a learning curve for us. Um, but, you know, you know, again, you tread this delicate balance um, because, you know, we're very clear that um, you know, we've done a lot of research and a lot of work, but as we all know, history is complicated. And so um, you know, we spent a lot of time um, making certain that we're telling the stories and we have the information correct, but we also know that when you're profiling, we have 72 women. Um, and, and part of this process is we're using the ebook as a call to have folks tell us additional stories. So we're going to have a process where people will be able to submit. I mean, we're going to make a template and we're going to make it available to our partner organizations and on our website. So now that, you know, we're basically saying these are the women that we found, um, you know, tell us, you know, who did we miss? Nominate somebody, you know, and so we want this not to be static. You want it to be an ongoing engaging process because, um, you know, again, I don't know about you um, and how you, you know, find stories in your heritage area, but we know every time we talk to somebody and we say what we're doing, they pull something else out of the air that we couldn't have possibly known. And, and we make it very clear that women's history, like so many other kinds of stories of underrepresented, you know, underrepresented stories, is it is really hard to find some of these stories. And once you find them, you know, I mean, everything from, and we were also very, um, worked really hard to bridge um, the historical time frame. So, you know, like, you know, shocking, well, it shouldn't be shocking, but you know, one of the women in the book is from Malden, and she was one of the first two African-American women to be in the Olympics, you know, and that's it, you know, and she founded the women's, uh, Colored Women's Bowling League. So we tried incredibly hard to, you know, have stories about people that were contemporary, and not just historical figures, authors, and writers, but athletes and scientists. And so it's an ongoing process. We don't see this as the end of this book. Okay, thank you. That was great. Any other questions? Patrice, that was one thing that I wrote down um, in, your, in your session about like, you know, what about women who are making history now? And, uh, you know, Jim touched on that and some of the exhibits that he is, is doing. And so I'm kind of curious about like how we, how we all kind of collectively highlight women who are making history right now. I mean, it's, it's happening in real time. And I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that or have thought about that at all. Um, I was just going to chime in. Hi, Vanessa from Castle Pooter National Heritage Area, Castle Pooter Heritage Alliance, um, located in Colorado. Fort Colorado, Northern Colorado. Um, we're also doing something, I don't know if it's been mentioned before, we've got a grant um, from NPF and we're, our grant is Lifting Voices from the Shadows on our webpage and I can toss up the link. We've been doing those, we had a all native women panel who talked about voting and so the women on the panel were actually representatives. We've had multiple videos are going to be coming out and we've done a fair amount, I shouldn't say we, Megan's done a fair amount of social media on it and it's gone really well. So I just want to chime that in and I'll drop the link. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, I you know, have one question for you, Scott. I'm really curious. I want to know more about this virtual lecture. How does that work? Which, which one are you talking about? I think it was the one that was like on the bridge with Sojourner Truth. Oh, um, it, it, they have a series of stations across there. And when you get close with your cell phone, it picks up and you can, you can pick it up from there. Oh, so it comes onto your phone. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. I, I believe that's what they're doing with this. Okay. Is, is you'll either be within a wireless zone or your or a cell zone. I'm not 
quite sure how they've got it set up. Okay. But um, it's that's the Friends Walkway over the Hudson is a state historical park now. Uh -huh. but the Friends group is the one who is is putting the interpretive stuff together. Okay. I'll Google it. I'm really curious about that. Thank you. I wasn't much help. <laughs> You were. You give me more information. <laughs> All right. Well, I, if there are no more questions or comments, I think we can conclude our August call, y'all. This was fun. Thanks for being nice for my first time. So, you did um, well. Katie, do you want to make, do we haven't decided about next month yet, have we? Next, we're hoping that our um, September call will feature the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Um, maybe our civil rights uh, grants that some heritage areas have received. Um, and so we're, we're working on that and have featured some heritage areas that re receive some of those grants or are part of those networks. Cool. Work in awesome. progress. All Thanks, right. everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.